Hello, everybody. Welcome to our session here on uh, remote teaching and online learning in an emergency and understanding the pandemic pedagogy. We'll be getting started in, I would say, about 30 seconds here. Again, everybody, welcome, and I got to play a quick little disclaimer. This presentation was produced under U.S. Department of Education contract number GS00F115CA with Synergy Enterprises, Inc. The views expressed herein do not necessarily represent the positions or policies of the U.S. Department of Education. No official endorsement by the U.S. Department of Education of any product, commodity, service, or enterprise mentioned herein is intended or should be inferred. Now, I can't hear you, Dave. I don't know if others can or not. Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's good to uh, be with you today. We're uh, getting ready to start our remote teaching and online learning in an emergency understanding the pandemic pedagogy. My name is Dave Mazza. I'm with the OIE staff, and I want to introduce our presenter, your presenter for today, Dr. Michael Barber. He's an associate professor of instructional design for the College of Education and Health Sciences at Turo University, in California. He's been involved with K-12 distance, online, and blended learning for over two decades as a researcher, evaluator, teacher, course designer, and administrator throughout the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and several other international jurisdictions. Dr. Barber, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Dave, and uh, welcome, folks. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so before I actually get started into the formal presentation, um, I, as Dave mentioned, I'm from Toro University, California, and uh, Toro University, California actually sits on uh, land that um, was included in the 1850-1851 uh, unratified treaties, and in particular, it sits on track 296, uh, which is the traditional land of the Karkin people, Although, as you can see from the map here, um, Solano County, which is where the university is located, is also traditional homes to uh, the Patwan and Miwok people as well. Um, I'm not sure, if, and I don't think you can see my video at this stage, but at the end, um, you will. And you'll note that I've got my orange shirt on. Uh, being a proud Canadian, um, I always uh, take the opportunity to participate in uh, Orange Shirt Day. Uh, which uh, was originally established back in 2013. Uh, Orange Shirt Day is on the 30th of September, and I wanted to mention to folks about this, uh, because while it's a Canadian thing, uh, the uh, idea behind it is to bring awareness to uh, Canada's residential school system and the, uh, to remember those that uh, both the survivors of it as well as those that uh, didn't survive. And since similar uh, models of schooling were implemented in many countries. Um, it is something that I think uh, uh, really should be an international event as opposed to just a, a Canadian event. So um, getting into, I guess, the, the content here and uh, to spend a, a little bit of background, I guess, to sort of situate us. Um, Distance education is not a, a new thing at the K-12 level. While it does have its roots in higher education, um, as you can see by the timeline that you've got there, uh, we've been doing distance education for well over a century now. And um, basically as the technologies have changed, uh, so has the way in which we've delivered distance learning 
um, to our K-12 populations. And uh, I like starting with this particular slide and you can see the transition there from uh, a use of correspondence education beginning at about the turn of the last century to using educational radio, which in certain parts of the United States, particularly the Midwest, uh, as well as in Australia in a big way, um, to instructional television, then more telematics or audiographic systems, to the online learning that we see today. And I like starting with this particular timeline because it's important to know all of these things that came beforehand. Um, because one of the things that we saw, particularly at the beginning of this pandemic, was those jurisdictions that still had access to content and still had access to the technology from some of these legacy models, in many cases actually fared far better in providing continuity of learning in those initial stages of the pandemic than other jurisdictions that needed to rely upon fancy devices and broadband and all of these other things that, that we associate more with the online learning. Um, now, if you look at um, online learning in particular, um, when you look at the United States, again, like the history of distance education, there's a much richer history of K-12 distance or K-12 online learning than what most of us are aware of. Um, it's actually, this is the 30th anniversary of the first full-time online school in the United States. It was a private school in California, Laurel Springs Schools. But you can see throughout the 90s, we saw the introduction of full-time and supplemental online programs. We've had two decades now of the cyber charter schools. Um, you can see that uh, when you, the timeline sort of cuts off a little bit, but by the time you get to 2011, there are, uh, there's online learning happening in all 50 states plus the, the District of Columbia. So we've got a decade where it's been happening everywhere in the US. And right now we're pegging it to be approximately five to six million uh, students that are engaged in, in K-12 online uh, learning pre-pandemic. Uh, so not including sort of all of the stuff that's uh, been happening since March of this year. So I've used a couple of terms here that I want to make sure folks are aware of. So the first was supplemental online learning. So supplemental online learning are situations where you have a student that's enrolled in a brick and mortar or face to face physical high school or physical school, I should say. It doesn't necessarily have to be a high school. And they're taking one or more of their courses online to be able to supplement what they can't get in the school or maybe that they just can't fit in their schedule. Um, you know, so you have got a student that wants to take AP calculus, but there's not enough students that want to take it. So the, the school offers it to them online. Uh, you have a student that wants to do both uh, music and uh, physics, and they're both offered in the same slot. So instead of having to take one or the other, they can take one in the classroom and take the other one in an online context. Uh, the important thing to remember with the supplemental programs are that all of the trappings and supports that you would normally have in a regular school are still available to that student. So they still have uh, the technology support that's available in the school. Uh, usually there's some sort of mentor, teacher, or facilitator, um, some sort of on-site coordinator that is overseeing the online learning that is happening for that particular student. Now, when you look at the US, um, for the most part, and then this one is basically your pre-pandemic. So this is the last regular school year that we had. Um, you can see sort of the states where this is happening. And these are the roughly four to five million students where would be in these states. Now, I say it like that because the four to five million in those states, because you'll notice that many of you are probably in some of the states that are in white. Many of you are probably aware of district-based programs that your um, students may be able to take advantage of. And that's actually one of the difficulties that we have with trying to sort of figure out how many students were engaged in this pre-pandemic is because in a lot of states, 
we have district run programs, but in most cases, they're not operated as separate schools. So we can't sort of say that, yes, there's 672 students that are taking courses from that program. Um, what ends up happening is they sort of fly under the radar. And, uh, you know, so if you look at a state like California, where I'm to, all of the districts that are contingent to my university offer some form of supplemental online learning. We really have no idea how many are there. The State Department of Education doesn't know how many are there. In many cases, the individual school districts wouldn't even be able to give you a firm number. Um, but of those that we can count, so those in the states in green, we can say that there are about four to five million. Now, the other term I used was this full-time online learning. And these are students that don't attend a physical or brick and mortar school at all. They do 100% of their schooling online. Um, if we were in normal times, all of those kids that are learning at home right now during the pandemic, they would be considered full-time online learners. And I say in normal times, because in a minute, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about why what we've seen since March of last year, so the last 13 months, isn't really online learning. It's, it's something a little bit different. But as you can see from the way this image is put together, while they have access to an online teacher, that online teacher is not with them. So the parent or the guardian really has to provide a lot of support for that particular student. And that's something that we've seen throughout the pandemic. Um, in those full-time models, most of them actually have a formal role for the parent or guardian. They generally call them learning coaches and they have a list of responsibilities that they are um, supposed to undertake on a regular basis with their student. Um, in fact, it, from a legal standpoint, um, there have been several court cases that have actually found that the parent or guardian in the role of learning coach provides the primary instructional role or primary instructional support for the individual student. Now, when you're looking at these programs, because they are standalone programs, for the most part, they have a Department of Education ID code. Uh, so we can figure out both which states are offering them for the most part um, and exactly how many students are enrolling in these programs. So you can see the states in red there. And again, this is back to the last full school year before the pandemic. Um, and you can see the rough enrollment of the um, students in that particular state. And they also have the percentage uh, right over on the very far right hand side, the percentage of K-12 students from that state that that makes up. So as an example, you see that Pennsylvania is at the top there with just over, just under, I guess, 36,000 students that were enrolled in full-time programs. And you can see that at the time, that was about 2% of all of the students that were in Pennsylvania, all the K-12 students that were in Pennsylvania. Now, I've mentioned a couple of times that what we've seen over the past year isn't really um, online learning. And it's important to really sort of understand a little bit about um, what we know or what we don't know about what's happened in the past 13 months. You know, so when the pandemic first hit, we saw a barrage of things that uh, happened. And uh, in all honesty, I will, you know, as, as someone who's been studying this field now for over two decades, I'll say that anything that happened in the spring at the teacher level my hat's off to each and every one of you. Um, you know, you were thrown into a situation that your teacher preparation programs hadn't prepared you for. Um, your districts had never come up with a specific plan to address these things. Your school leaders and district leaders, your Department of Education leadership didn't have a, a firm plan to address this. And you guys did some amazing things throughout that time, both with the tools that you had available, but also providing in some cases, a lot of that personal touch that uh, we saw on the previous slide. And I mean, you can see, my guess is, is that many, if not necessarily many, some of you probably have rooms like this at your home, or at least maybe you did in the spring of the year. I know during the spring of the year, mine probably looked a lot more like the one on the uh, left-hand side of the screen. Although I do have one of those fancy 
um, selfie lights now to give a little bit better lighting in here. Um, one of my pandemic purchases, if you will, which I think we've all done in the past 13 months. Um, but what's been happening in these past 13 months isn't online learning. Um, it's emergency remote learning or emergency remote teaching. And the phrase actually was coined by uh, these researchers here led by Chuck Hodges. But uh, if you do get the opportunity, I'd encourage you to go to um, our State of the Nation uh, K-12 e-learning in Canada website, because one of the things that we did was I worked with those uh, authors to essentially create a K-12 version of their document, which was originally focused upon higher ed. So I think it's something that um, will be quite useful to you in sort of tracing out how things look, because online learning, as you can see from the, the slide here, is planned. It's something that, you know, we look at, okay, what tools do we need? How do we want to create a program for these particular students? How do we create the content? How are we going to deliver it? What sort of modalities are we going to use? Um, are we going to use a learning management system or a collection of other tools? Are we going to have some variety of both? Which tools are we going to select? How do we train our teachers to use those tools? not just use them, but use them effective. You know, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that happens as you're going through this. Um, as most of you probably experienced in mid-March of last year, you know, all of that planning and preparation and process didn't happen. Um, you know, we had this temporary shift and unfortunately it's been a little bit less temporary than what most of us would have hoped, but it's still temporary in nature. And the reason I say it's temporary in nature is because Basically, the system is set up in such a way that we're only using these online tools and these distant or remote modalities until we can come back to the regular classroom. And while some of the experiences that we've had right now may still continue into whatever the new normal is going to look like post pandemic, really the idea right now is, you know, let's just use these things as a stop gap measure to provide the best kind of model that we can given the crisis circumstances or the emergency circumstances until we can get back to what it is that we were trained to do, what it is that we've done for a long time, what it is our system is set up to do. Um, if you sort of look at kind of what happened, uh, this is the phases that, that we're talking about here. And what happened in the spring and into the summer was really that phase one, phase two. Most of this school year has been spent in phase three, where we've sort of been bouncing back and forth between face-to-face, -face, hybrid, online, depending upon where you are and what's been happening with the uh, pandemic in your jurisdiction. And at some point in the future, um, we are going to emerge into a new normal. And while the new normal may look a lot like you know, the pre-2020 learning, it's probably gonna change a little bit because of the experiences that we've had, the tools that we've been using, uh, the flexibility that some of this system has offered to us. So if you think about what's been happening now in the 2020-21 school year, what you've seen is a variety of models here, and it's really had an impact upon how we've been doing our work. So, you know, there's a, a collection of news items here on the screen to give you, you know, some of, of the models, but also some of the issues that have been happening. You know, so we've had some of these hybrid models. We've had um, situations like the Canadian article over on the far left hand side, where you've got, you know, you're teaching both roomies and zoomies at the same time, you know, those that are in the room with you, but also so many more that are on zoom and you're broadcasting your 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 instruction and trying to manage both groups. Um, at the same time, you've got others that are devoted 100% to teaching online and your some of your colleagues are 100% face to face and you've sort of done a division of labor like that. But one of the things that's been happening with this is, you know, first of all, there's been a real tension um, that's been happening just in terms of what model gets picked and how that impacts uh, the individuals that are supposed to deliver that model, you guys. 
Um, you know, let's face it. I mean, even now with the, the vaccine that's been uh, developed, as it stands right now, maybe your grade 11s and grade 12s will get it sometime this year. But if you're teaching anything less than grade, uh, you know, 10 or less, you know, you're teaching a group of kids that aren't eligible for the vaccine yet. And while there's, an, you know, an application that will likely be sent to the FDA soon, um, that only goes down to 12 years of age. And there's clinical trials now for five and up to be able to do all school age, you know, but so there's still a lot of uncertainty and a lot of knowledge that we don't have. And unfortunately, so many of those of us in the teaching profession, you know, we tend to be folks that by age or by, you know, particularly in the last year, I say the sedentary lifestyle that, you know, we have sitting in front of a computer a lot of the time. Um, you know, many of us fall into those higher risk categories, and there's been uh, a real strain that's been put on the teaching profession. At the same time, there's been strain that has been put on our, our, our students. You know, we, we've had students that, and we've all seen these, these news items that have been posted. You know, some of these you can see I've, I've pulled off of my Facebook page or my Twitter stream, you know, but uh, kids that are, you know, having to, you know, not being able to connect at home, not having the proper devices at home. You can see the CNN article in the middle of the screen where we've got kids that, we had in our school system last year that we've just lost because you know we don't know how to get a hold of them. They haven't connected in the online version of the school we started doing in the fall, and and we just don't know where they are. Uh, we've got others because you know we, we're while teachers are doing their best, this is not something that we've been trained to teach at a distance like this. Um, even, uh, you know, I'm an instructional technology professor, and I can guarantee you that this would be a much more dynamic process if we could all sit in a room somewhere and, and have a conversation about this. And you could see me be animate, animated about these things, and I could see your reactions to what I'm saying and determine should I spend more or less time. You know, these are all things that, you know impact your teaching and, and they impact the learning that you're having, particularly the social emotional learning that your students are having. Um, you know, if you've, and I put it sort of right front center so it would catch your attention, but that quote there that uh, Mary Rice uh, had mentioned, um, you know, happened in, in the class of one of her daughter, uh, one of her daughter's classes, uh, one of the classmates. And, you know, I mean, when you read stuff like that, it, it, it's kind of heartbreaking and, and you start to wonder, you know, well, how do we do this better? How, how can we, you know, address some of these issues? And it's important that we actually ask those questions because it's not like we're at the end of this yet. I mean, yes, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. My own governor is getting rid of his pandemic uh, tier system on the 15th of June so that, um, you know, everything can go back to normal, um, at least from a planning perspective. But one of the things that we know about pandemics is they happen fairly frequently. I mean, if you look at the history of pandemics, as you can see from this chart, we usually have a couple, three, sometimes four every century. And, and it's also important to note that while we tend to have between, say, two to five roughly every century on average that are considered global in nature and large enough that they sort of, you know, show up on this uh, chart, we've had five thus far in this century. You know, so you see five little things down there at the bottom, you know, and while none of them have had the impact that COVID-19 have had, there have been five in the last 21 years. How many more are we going to have in the next 79 years of this century? When is the next time that our entire school system is going to have to close down, either in our district or in our state or across the nation or around the world like we've seen this time? So this is something that we've got to really start to sit down and figure out, you know, even forgetting the next pandemic, you know, what about the, the, the next wave here? I mean, you know, the vaccines present a great promise, but they present a promise. There's a lot that we don't know about these things yet. Those people that were part of the clinical trials, they've only been vaccinated for six to eight months right now. And while their numbers are still holding in terms of their, um, you know, their, their, prevention or their protection from the virus. We don't know what it's going to be like a year from now, two years from now. Is this something that 
you know, a lot of vaccines require an annual booster or every five or 10 years, uh, a booster or something like that. And while we can get 70 or 80% that are willing to do it now, because we've spent a year of our lives, you know, plus in turmoil, what's that percentage going to be look like if two years from now, everyone's got to get a booster, you know, is it still going to be 70, 80%, or is that going to drop significantly to the 30% or less that we see taking an annual flu shot as an example. And what impact is that going to have up on the school system and how we go about delivering education? Because one of the things that we do know about these type of pandemics is they come in waves. And while most places have experienced two or three waves at this point, I know most of my home country, Canada right now is actually struck with its third wave. Um, it's not necessary that it's going to be just three. Um, you know, the Spanish flu had three major waves, but it, that wasn't the only waves that it had. And that's a little precursor to where I'm going to sort of finish up. Um, so when we look at these things, we need to be ready at a moment's notice to have the planning in place, to have the preparation for our teaching staff so that we could implement this four phase model again next year or three years from now or eight years from now or hopefully 30, 40 years from now when, you know, we're all retired and, and, and not having to worry about um, what's happening in the K-12 system. But we're going to have to do this again. So we need to be ready to do it. So how do we go about it? Well, when you look at best practices, these are sort of the stages that you would go through to develop a best practice. So there's a process that, that happens to ensure that we know Yes, if you do this, it will be effective in the classroom. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, for the most part, when you look at the literature that we've got around um, K-12 distance and online learning, even though we've got a long history of it, there's still a lot of stuff we don't know about. In fact, most of what happens, particularly with the latest tools that we have available in terms of online tools, we really don't have a good sense as to um, how we can use those things effectively. So one of the problems is you have a lot of studies that you see like this one of mine, you know, so it's called principles of effective web-based content for secondary students. So that's basically a fancy way of saying principles of how you design online content for high schoolers. And it sounds really authoritarian, you know, these are principles which means they must be good. They must be things that you should look at. But when you actually look at the study itself, one of the things that you actually find out is that, um, so there's seven principles that I've come up with, but these principles were based upon interviews with six course designers who had designed at least one course for a supplemental virtual school in one province. At no point did I actually go and look at their courses to see if they were actually doing the things that they said were, in their mind, best practices. At no point did I look at any data to determine whether or not the students that were in courses that had these best practices did better than students that didn't have, you know, that were in courses where these best practices weren't done. Um, for that matter, I never even, you know, looked to see if the administration of the virtual school or the colleagues of these individuals thought that they were good designers in the first place. You know, like so many other educational researchers, I basically said, okay, I'm going to do a study with this particular school, this, in this case, a virtual school, and that we are going to send out a request to all the people that qualify and those that volunteer. And I think there was like 19 that qualified. And so six, which is not bad. I mean, it was roughly a third of the people. Um, six of them volunteered to be interviewed. But, you know, and it's not that the principles are necessarily bad. I, I may be a bit biased when I say this, but I happen to think they're kind of good. Um, I think that they're a good starting point. But the reality is, is that, you know, they aren't best practices. They aren't principles, if you will. Um, they are basically the opinions, the unvalidated opinions, if you will, of these six individuals. 
Um, and when you look at some of you know the research that's out there, that tends to be the type of thing that you'll see. You'll see a lot of folks that talk about, um, and you don't have to worry about reading all of the text here. Um, the slides will be available. Um, if not in the um, system that we've been using, I'll have them available on my website and I can link that into uh, the system as well. So, um, but in most cases, they tend to be basically case studies or descriptive research. Uh, so they're small scale type things, but because they, uh, they tend to have small samples because of that, but because academics are is set up in the way it is and we need to publish uh, in order to essentially be promoted and have success in our careers, we tend to overreach with the language that we use for many of these things. Um, and in addition to sort of that, I mean, what you've got when you look at the research and when you do find um, the, you know, what you think you're looking for, and even if you look at it and you see that, you know, it looks like it's a large sample size and over multiple years and multiple contexts and those kind of things, you know, one of the things that you want to kind of keep in mind is our field tends to be fairly small. You know, so there was a, a study that a group of doctoral students that I was working with did uh, that looked at, uh, there were 300, I think it was 56 articles that we were able to identify from 1994 uh, to, I believe we cut it off in, in 2017. Um, and from that group of people, we found that there were 384 distinct authors. So basically 384 people that had their name public, you know, listed as an author on one or more of the articles. But the thing is, if you look at it, most of those people, and you can see the top 11 folks there, if you start to count up uh, the number of articles there, assuming that some of them probably co-authored things with each other, what you find is that almost 80% um, almost of the articles were, I think it was like 70, some 78, 77% were authored by one of those 11 people. The other thing that you'll note is that of the 384 distinct people, 276 of them published a single article. There were 150 journals that had published articles um, and 102 of them had published one article and that's it. So if you look at it, 75% of the people made one contribution to a field that they knew nothing about before they published and then have done nothing with since. And the people that reviewed the articles to get them published, two thirds of them were published in a place where they had no experience with this whatsoever before they published that one article and they've had no experience with it since. Um, so as you're looking, and, and this is sort of a, a detailed but data-driven way to basically tell you that as you're looking at articles that are out there, one of the most important things is that just because you found a, p a published piece of research in our field that says something, that advises you to do something, while it could be a good starting point for things to try, it's not something that I would recommend as being, you know, this is something you should do. Because when you look at the quality of research in the field and, and sort of the problematic nature of a lot of what happens, this is what you run up against. Um, and, you know, from a, I guess, a more academic sense, really the field has five five individual failings, if you will. And I won't go into any of these, just present them to you so that you know that they are there. Um, there's a growing body of literature now that talks about each of these five, but um, I want to sort of transition back into um, this idea of these best practices, because if you look at what we've got, we've got a whole hell of a lot that does the first thing. We've got a little bit of stuff that's starting to do the next two things and almost nothing that does the last two things. So it does beg the question, you know, what sort of strategies have we seen research on that do show a bit of promise? You know, what are those promising practices that we can start to transition to? And there are some things that I would throw out there that are ones that I think really are worth, not just worth considering, but worth actually 
trying out and adopting as we continue to bounce back and forth between the face-to-face -face hybrid remote, you know, whatever model that we've got. Um, so the first, and, and I'll sort of go through these in, in sort of three roles, um, because one of the nice pieces of research that Nikki Davis and her team, when she was at Iowa State did, uh, was they looked at this notion of the virtual school teacher, the virtual school facilitator, so that in-school teacher that sort of helps out a little bit, um, and then the virtual school designer, so that person that actually designs the online content. And obviously the teacher is, the first one I mentioned, is the one that delivers it. And when you sort of think about the distance or remote learning as having those three different people involved, um, you can start to see how, you know, you can start to fill some of that out because that facilitator, that local person doesn't necessarily have to be one person. You know, it could be someone that's assigned to them while they're actually in a distance learning lab, actually learning stuff. But there's all sorts of other people that can be involved in that equation that can be at the local level, provide that help as well in those supplemental contexts or those hybrid contexts where you're seeing the student from time to time. Um, so as you sort of think about these three models and moving forward on them, looking at the designer one, um, you know, those were the seven principles that I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, if you are designing online content for your student, I think that this is a good place to start. Uh, we've done actually subsequent research that's uh, supported some of these, although it's still in that very top of the stage. So it's a, a strategy that has shown some promise, but we haven't done a lot of the second or third level things. Um, there are a lot of standards out there. Um, I'll be honest with you and say that when you start to look at the research into some of those standards, um, it's a buyer beware kind of situation. In all honesty, what I would recommend, and they are proprietary in nature, and they do cost a bit of money, uh, but the Quality Matters framework uh, that was originally developed at the University of Maryland, um, they, I think, have a, a good model. The National Standards for Quality, the NSQ project, which Quality Matters is now leading, um, they're not bad. Um, that's why they're sort of a gray thing there. Um, the International Association for K-12 Online Learning, now called the Aurora Institute, um, I would, from a research standpoint and from a support standpoint, I would stay away uh, from those. Unfortunately, or sorry, um, so these are the, the ones that are probably the most accessible to you, this uh, NSQ project, uh, which, you know, QM is involved with, so they're not bad. Um, I would use them if you don't want to spend the hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars to become a Quality Matters location. This is a good starting point. I would strongly recommend that you sort of stay away from these ones. Um, unfortunately, these ones tend to be the dominant ones in the field. Uh, they were the first ones around the, the INACO or International Association for K-12 Online Learning. Um, they were the first ones that were out. They uh, have tended to get the largest proliferation. There are some states that have even adopted them as part of the, the DOE's review of online courses. Um, they are also the ones that have the least research backing. So they're the ones that personally I would recommend staying away from. Um, looking at the virtual school teacher, um, while it's a single study, uh, so it's another one of these case studies, Meredith DiPietro has done a couple of studies that I would strongly recommend. Uh, this one here, best practices, and again, she uses the term best practices, like I use the term principles. Um, so they're not really best practices, but she does come, I think there's, I think it's 27 or 37. Um, principle or practices that she describes in here that came about from the uh, 16 virtual school teachers at the Michigan virtual school that she interviewed. Those particular practices, I think, are a good starting point. And if you uh, continue to teach in a remote fashion, uh, you know, that's an article that, and it's an open source article, which is the nice thing. You can uh, just Google the, the, the title or you can see the URL up in the top corner there. Um, and just grab it for free online. Um, she's done a follow-up study that came out two years later uh, where she came up with these 17, is that 17? 12, two, three, yeah, 17 practices uh, or characteristics, sorry, um, or strategies that she had 
um, in that one. And you can see they're organized around different themes. So for your purposes, if you are delivering um, any uh, remote learning, the ones that she describes around community, student engagement, and supporting and assessing students, I think are particularly useful for you. Um, again, I will, and I put this up there mainly so it could be in the slides when you looked at them afterwards, uh, but the, um, again, this is a single case study, so that's sort of the caveat to put uh, in there. Um, and this was actually, sorry, the follow-up study that she had. Um, one thing that I would strongly recommend, and this is actually probably one of the best resources that uh, I've seen, um, is this open book. So this is a free book. If you go to that edtechbooks.org forward slash K-12 blended, um, it's a free book that's available that uh, Charles and Jared and Cecil and Leanna have created. Uh, while they actually um, have the... Uh, um, focus on blended learning. As you can see from the four squares that they've got on the front, um, all of those things are things that you would need to do in an online environment as well. Uh, so this, I think, is a great guide. Um, it, they haven't done any data collection on those four things yet. Uh, they do have a blended teaching readiness assessment that you can do that they have been collecting data. Uh, I see your question, John. Um, I can start throwing some of those up afterwards so that uh, either the links or the files will be in the session here. Um, and I know we've got a follow-up conversation session in the next slot. And because that's more informal, I can probably go and grab them while we're doing that. Uh, but the slides will be available there and you can see the URLs for most of these um, on there. And um, so moving to the facilitator, for those of you that have students that are learning in a supplemental environment, um, as you're looking through, one of the things that you want to uh, make sure that um, you do is focus upon this role, because of all of the things that I've talked about thus far, the one that has the most research base to date is the fact that if you have students that are learning online in a supplemental fashion, that the presence or absence of a trained and active facilitator can actually have a statistically significant impact upon student success. And as you can see from sort of the, the bullets that are there, you can get a sense as to what some of the roles or some of the duties of that facilitator might be. Um, in terms of looking at, the, I guess, the difference between what the teacher that's at the school would do compared to what the teacher that is online, the online teacher, the virtual school teacher would do, um, while there is a bit of overlap from it, you can see that really the on-site mentor uh, is, is really a, a, a guide. Like, um, if I was had a student that I was supporting who was, say, taking a, a, a calculus class. Um, it's been a long time since I had to take a calculus class. Heck, it's been a long time since I've had to take an algebra class. I was a social studies teacher. Um, and most of that that I did learn, I probably forgot shortly after um, the year was out or definitely by the time I you know, finished my K-12 environment because I didn't take any math classes after that. I can probably, for the purposes of assisting a student, muddle my way through trying to figure out what, you know, using the textbook and whatever online content that the teachers put up there, I can muddle my way through and sort of problem solve and critical think my way to an answer. It might not be the right answer, hopefully it will be, um, but sort of helping the student with that and modeling those sort of problem solving skills and, you know, just being someone in the room that recognizes that that kid is in front of a computer and a little bit frustrated because they haven't made progress along the way. You know, that's really the role of that facilitator, that on-site mentor. You know, so you're not there to necessarily teach the content. It's really to help the, the, the students along. Um, so hopefully that differentiates the role a little bit there. And you can sort of see how the types of things that not only they do, but if you sort of think about that distance environment where you don't see your teacher, um, you know, they're miles, you know, hundreds of miles away from you in some other location, and you never lay eyes on them. The types of things that are described here are really important roles in that learning process that we have. Um, and there have actually been training programs, and the, the UNC folks at uh, Chapel Hill 
uh, had a, a national research center called the uh, NRC for Rural Education Support. And they developed an open source training program that um, isn't available online, but if you contact the center, they will make available to you. And um, while you can see all the sort of things that they were doing research about, I mentioned this in particular because, again, if you contact the center, each of the articles that they've written about this references an open source training program that you should be able to get a copy of, that you would be able to use with your teachers that may be supporting students that are learning in an online environment. Um, you know, because one of the things I think that we don't do enough of in education is we don't share things enough openly. Um, you know, there's no need for you guys to recreate uh, for every school leader that's that's in the audience to have to recreate their own program. Um, they can use these programs easily enough. Um, if you haven't come across them before, I would highly recommend uh, the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute in general. Now they do have these guides uh, for online learning and they've and uh, so they've got one for students, one for parents, one for mentors, one for online teachers, one for um, district and school leaders. <laughs> I think there's one for school board members. Uh, so th they've got these guides that they've created that I think are exceptional resources uh, that are available that you can use. I know a couple of Canadian provinces that have worked with the, the Michigan virtual folks to actually adapt them for a Canadian audience and have actually used that material in their own jurisdictions. Uh, they also have this online learning orientation tool, which I also think incredibly highly of. Um, it likely will need to be adapted a bit for your environment. But one of the nice things I really like about this particular tool is that it actually focuses a lot on the soft learning skills. So it gives students strategies that they can use and tries to teach them some of those, you know, self-motivation, self-directedness, um, uh, those self-regulated type skills that they need to have success in this environment. Um, so using this tool as a starting point, and again, it's, it's available for you to use online, um, but using it as a starting point that you could then adapt to your particular school or your particular environment, I think is incredibly useful. Um, probably, I think, and it's a, a new piece of research, you see it only came out um, this past year, uh, Jared Borup and his colleagues um, created this um, ACE framework. And essentially what you have here is it looks at essentially all of the abilities that a student has and then all of the ways in which they need to engage with their course from a cognitive, behavioral, and affective way. And then how either the course or the student's individual community, which could include you know, everything one from their parents to older siblings to those school based support folks that they have, you know, how do they provide a, a model of um, support that will essentially help the student so that they get to the outsides of that triangle where you get the, the, the engagement necessary for academic success? Because while they're shown as sort of three perfectly spaced and perfectly sized triangles here, the reality is our students don't come in that way. You know, you might have a student that, you know, has high level of cognitive engagement, but a very low level of behavioral engagement. So you've got sort of a very skewed triangle that you're looking at there. So it's up to the individuals to try to figure out, you know, how do we uh, massage the supports that either <coughs> are in the course or that we are able to provide through that personal community to ensure that that student can have success. Beyond those that we've looked at that um, are just those that show promise, there are some that have moved into those next two levels there. So that we've actually started to do some research on, we've started to refine um, some of the um, strategies or the, the specific ideas that are mentioned in them. And these are the ones, so while the other ones I think are good, um, these ones here, I think, are stellar. Uh, so if you're, uh, I should have probably did it the other way around. I should have probably gave you the best stuff first and then talked about some other good stuff. But, uh, well, here we are. Um, 
So while it is dated, and I you can see from the dates at the bottom that most of this stuff is 20 years old, it is still the best research that we have available about the delivery of education using online tools at a distance. Um, the Virtual High School, which was uh, one of the first online programs created, uh, started back in 96, 97. Uh, I was created with a five-year federal grant. And as a part of that grant, they actually had to have external evaluators looking at them. Um, and it was a really a nice collaboration because what happened was the online program identified seven goals and said, by the end of the five years, we'd like to be good at these seven things. And then it was the evaluator's job to tell them how they were doing on those seven things on an annual basis and if they were really having difficulty with any one of those seven things, <coughs> to do more serious and more focused investigations on whichever of those seven things that they were missing. So what ends up happening is you have this robust body of research that came out, most of which is available freely online. Um, if you were to go and search evaluation virtual high school, you'll find PDFs of those first three annual evaluations. You'll find a PDF of one of the two subject specific evaluations. The book that you see covered there, Virtual High School Teaching Generation V, that book is uh, available on Amazon and I think it's fairly cheap if you get a second hand one. The other subject specific one is actually another book that they published. That's the uh, Elbaum, McIntyre and Smith one. Um, so this is all stuff that you can get and get readily, fairly readily available. Um, you have to get over the fact that they call online courses net courses, because that's the terminology they used in the grant back in 1995 when they submitted it. But beyond that, the actual goals that they have and the things that they learned from this evaluation it still represents the best work that's out there. And in all honesty, if I were starting my own online program, these are resources that I would put into the hands of all of the people that I hired initially, because this to me represents at least based on what we have to date, the gold standard of what's available. A step down from that, and I know I knocked them a lot uh, a little bit ago with the, you know, but the International Association of K-12 Online Learner, INACL, uh, collaborated with the a couple of faculty, uh, Rick Fertig and Catherine Cavanaugh, uh, Kathy Cavanaugh at the University of Florida to essentially produce um, a couple of books, actually, looking at the lessons learned from virtual schools. And these virtual schools were part of a grant, a four-year grant that the Florida or that the, the University of Florida had. And for the most part, they tend to represent a wide variety of programs. So when you look at um, the, the book itself, this Lessons Learned from Virtual Schools uh, has 13 content-based chapters. And each of those chapters is written by a different online program. And each of the online programs are slightly different. So you have some that are full-time cyber charters that you know, have the corporate um, EMO, educational management organization owners. There are district-based supplemental programs. There are statewide supplemental programs. Uh, there's one private school in there, if memory serves me correct. So there's a variety of different types of programs that are there. And each of these programs worked with the Florida, uh, the University of Florida over this three-year period to essentially address in a data-driven way questions that the individual program had. And over that four-year period, using the tools and the analysis and the metrics that the University of Florida researchers came up with, they would make changes to their program and then assess, okay, what's the impact of that change? Are things going better or worse than what they were before we started fooling around with this? Um, so they had four years of this, and it, it really did a good job at looking at some of these issues. So while not quite as good as the virtual high school stuff that I just mentioned, this is probably the, the first major PD that I were to do with my newly formed virtual school that, uh, you know, is fictitious and I've just made up. Um, this is probably the resource I would give to all of my staff on that first major PD after we've already spent some time from that initial setup with the, the virtual school stuff. A tool that I would definitely implement 
with all of my teachers or with all of my students actually, is this educational success prediction instrument or ISPRI is what it's often called, E-S-P-R-I. Um, essentially, this is a tool that's a, right now a, as you can see, roughly 25 question instrument that looks at these four areas. Uh, that's got a fair amount of research behind it. I mean, not you know, the, the types we'd like to see to be a best practice, but definitely beyond just those promising ideas. Um, in fact, the tool, the instrument itself has been found to be somewhere between 92 and 96 percent effective in determining whether or not a student is going to have success in an independent learning environment like an online course. Um, the, I guess, difficulty or the limitation of this particular uh, instrument is the simple fact that it is a prediction instrument. You know, so we predict that you're going to fail. Now go forth and fail. Um, you know, one of the things that, that Margaret Robley and her team had always intended to do, but never were able to receive the funding for, is to create an orientation tool, similar to that OLOT tool that I mentioned that the Michigan virtual folks uh, had developed that would remediate some of these things. You know, so we see that you're weak in organizational strategies. Let us give you some, you know, some ideas, some tricks that you can use to try to address some of those deficiencies. I mentioned them a couple of minutes ago and, and, and um, the Michigan Virtual Research, uh, Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute is really a stellar organization. Um, if you've never looked at their work before, I highly encourage it. This is a, a research body that was actually set up by a legislative statute and they were actually asked to look at these 19 areas. And I know you can't read this slide and it's not intended for it to be read. It's just intended for you to sort of see how detailed and descriptive the state lawmakers were when they picked out the 19 specific things that they wanted to know more about when it came to online and blended learning so that it could guide the policy and practice that were happening in that state. And they've done a really good job on it. And they've been, you know, the research that they've been doing now, they've been doing uh, for, actually, it's probably about a decade now, uh, eight, nine years, I think, is uh, this year. <coughs> and one of the things that they actually published um, at the, uh, uh, over the, I think it came out in the early fall, late summer, um, they published these 10 reports. And essentially, they're review reports. So what they did was they picked 10 topics or sort of got 10 categories of things, if you will and said, let's look at all of the past research that we've produced over this, at this point, it would have been seven to eight years to see what are things that we've actually learned about online teacher preparation and professional development or about um, K-12 online learning with special learner populations. You know, what are the things that, because we've been looking at this now for seven or eight years, we've got all kinds of data, we've contracted with all of these uh, external researchers to do these reports. What have we actually learned? What are the takeaways? So these reports are, in my mind, required reading for anyone that's in this space. Uh, and I would start based upon sort of where you are in this space. You know, if you're a special education teacher, Look at the special learner populations one. If you're doing a lot of blended learning yourself, maybe look at the K-12 blended learning one first or the blended teaching and professional development one. If you've got supplemental students at your school and you're wondering how to support them, the K-12 online or the K-12 on-site mentoring uh, report is probably a good starting point. But in all honesty, I think all 10 of these are worth looking through because they really have some great information in there and things that I think are quite useful. Um, and it's really important that we do this because we know that our programs haven't prepared us for this. You know, even if the pandemic didn't happen, you know, we know that next to no, and you can see, you know, two studies there at the bottom of, of how many teacher education programs actually focus upon this, you know, 4%, um, that's about one in every 23. Um, so if you happen to be lucky enough to be at the one of those 23 that did great, uh, but for the folks that attended one of the other 22 universities, um, you know, uh, we're left, you know, without that. Um, even online programs themselves, uh, in, in the only really major study that's been done of professional development provided to online programs, found that less than half of them, 40% of them, 
actually said they got any PD, any professional development, professional learning about how to teach online before they had to start teaching online. I mean, you know, that really makes not a lot of sense at all. Um, you know, it's not like we would ever go to, you know, bring our car to the garage and, and pull in and, and give it to a mechanic who is going to learn how to be a mechanic by working on your engine. Right. But that's essentially what we've done with a lot of these online teaching environments. You know, and it's important that we, we think about this because, you know, while I talked about these waves that were happening and the fact that there could be subsequent waves, we don't know what's going to happen with the vaccine. Um, so, you know, this could become an annual thing, a semi-annual thing. Um, you know, it, it's really important to sort of know and, you know, the fact that we could have another pandemic. I mean, based on our current trajectory, we, we should be expecting another one in the next four years because we've had five and 21 years. So next four, four and a half years would be the one in the next one comes around. But, you know, it's important to remember some of these because, you know, if you look at, you know, one of the things we base a lot of this on is what we see from history. You know, so this is the Spanish flu trajectory. And you can see kind of like you've seen now with the COVID-19, you know, there have been three distinct waves. Does anyone know what happened after this chart runs out. So this chart runs out by the looks of it in May of um, in May of 1919. What happens to the Spanish flu after May of 1919? Not seeing anything come in the chat. I'm always just pausing a little bit for both dramatics plus to see um, if someone came in either the chat to look at it. Um, Basically, it mutated to a much less lethal form. And because a bunch of folks up in the Swiss Alps who had the Spanish flu were discovered about three decades ago, we've been actually able to get the sequencing from this. Um, we know that one of the things that's happened is that it's just continued with us. The seasonal flu that we get vaccine that we get vaccinated for every year, that is this Spanish flu continuing on through to today. Right. We don't you know, so we don't know what's going to happen with COVID. We don't know if it's going to mutate to something much more, you know, uh, accessible and uh, transmissible and much more dangerous. We don't know if it's going to transmit, you know, mutate into something that's much less dangerous, like the seasonal flu that the, the Spanish flu turned into. So we've got to be ready for some of these things. We've got to make sure our teachers are aware of all of these things, because that's something that's going to become important to us. Um, you know, so we've got to be ready for these phases and to be able to implement this aspect again. Um, and it's not like we, we, we haven't been talking about this for a while. Um, you know, we've been talking now for about a decade about using online learning to for short term closures like snow days. Um, we've seen in certain cases where it, some form of distance education has been used to provide some continuity of learning uh, in natural disasters. And while the US hurricane season is not the greatest example because uh, they haven't had a great deal of success with that, um, the earthquakes that they had in New Zealand in 2009 or 2011 were actually exceptional examples of that because with the exception of the fact that they had to close schools for a little bit to figure out which ones they could open, um, it did really provide a, a good sense of continuity of learning, even though there were less than half in Christchurch that they were able to uh, reopen because of the work that they had done with distance learning. They were able to continue to provide some continuity of learning. Um, you know, and this is something that even with the online tools that we've done, you know, I mentioned those other pandemics that we've had in this century. Um, you know, things like H1N1 and, and uh, swine flu, SARS, MERS, you know, those have been the precursor, if you will, or the spark that have started a lot of other jurisdictions for coming up with ways to make sure that both teachers and well, as well as school systems were prepared for these kinds of closures. And, you know, now that we've gone through this once, because we were largely unaffected by many of those 
earlier pandemics that, uh, you know, Hong Kong is probably the best example here because they've been affected, it seems, by just about every one of these pandemics and had to shut down for a certain period of time. And each time they have, they've learned more about how to use the tools to continue with that continuity of learning. Um, you know, because I've always found it interesting about how surprised we were around a lot of this. Um, you know, this is a 2016 article and you can see the things that, you know, the five areas that, you know, five years ago, this team of, of researchers were telling us we needed to figure out. Um, does any of those five things sound familiar to the experience you guys have had in the past 13 months? Um, you know, these are the, the issues that we need to, to address. Um, and those schools that really had access to some of those older forms, I mean, I, I'm using examples from previous pandemics of how they've used uh, legacy technologies, but the LA school district signed an agreement with their local PBS to provide instructional programming throughout the day. In New Zealand, that correspondence school that's referenced with the polio epidemic actually stepped in and provided an extensive amount of materials and tools to students when this pandemic happened. Um, you know, so you've got a lot of things that could be happening that some people had done in very small ways. And you can see the, the articles here, uh, the one on the far left re references the uh, LA Times and the, um, the PBS agreement. Uh, the one from Australia there is looking at the schools of the air, which were educational radio program uh, programming that they used uh, that is still used extensively for distance education, you know, sending out packets available to folks. All of these things are things that, you know, we could have done this time around. And for a lot of our students that were challenged with connectivity and devices, these are the types of things that might have made a difference to those students. You know, so again, I, I keep coming back and saying, we've got to be ready for this. Um, you know, we've got a plan for this now, because while we're almost out of this way, you know, this particular foxhole that we're in, there's going to be another foxhole that we're all going to have to dive into at some point. Um, so we've got to be ready for when that happens. Um, before I sort of transition, um, I, I know we've got another session coming up. I think... Um, well, this one, I believe, ends in 10 minutes, um, and then there's a conversation session happening where we can have a, a, some more um, free flow, not in the webinar format, but I've been watching through the um, chat, and I haven't seen any questions coming through yet, but I'm wondering if folks do have questions uh, along the way, and Dave, you can let me know if I've missed anything that uh, has been happening. Um, yes, uh Michael, there was a question about that instrument you talked about, and they were asking you if that instrument had been validated. Yes. So the um, just go this way so I can actually look at folks here now. Um, I guess I can't look at folks, but at least folks can look at me. You can see the, the orange shirt I was uh, talking about. Uh, yes. So the the four study, the three studies that uh, Rob Lee and her team did uh, were all validation studies. In one, it was found to have a uh, reliability of 0.92. The other one, um, the second one, it was 0.96, and the third one was 0.95. Uh, so that's why I said that you know it had it, it could reliably predict between 92 to 96 percent of the students that would. Um, pass or fail, uh, would have success or failure in an online course. And uh, the instrument is actually an open access one. Um, I can't remember which of Rob Lier's, uh tools or which of her articles have it in, but I think they're all published behind paywalls, but I can, and let me um, push it out here. Um, in the chat here, I'll, there's a former doc student of mine by the name of Jason Psycho. Um, S-I-K-O, and um, I'm not, Dave, hopefully you can, I'll put it in the chat in here because I can't seem to get the spot that, uh, but if you were to Google Jason Psycho Ispri, E-S-P-R-I, um, that will actually uh, bring up an open access article that Jason uh, published using this particular instrument. And uh, in the, um, in the appendices, I think it's Appendix A, 
because I think there's multiple ones in there. He actually has the 25 question instrument in there. Um, and off as well, the article can help you do figure out how to actually analyze it, but you get a copy of the instrument that way. Whereas with uh, Margaret's stuff, um, most of it is published behind paywall. Um, I see Cynthia, or sorry, Car Carmelita has made a comment about um, that it would be good for, there, there's a lot of, um, potential studies for folks that might be interested in. Uh, she uses the term doctoral candidates for their dissertations. Um, I'd also say for, for master's uh, students that have to do a thesis or some sort of capstone project, um, because you could a lot of this could be done in an action research kind of way. So for those of you that may be um, you know, doing your master's now and, and, and you, you have to do a, a capstone or thesis project, doing it with your own class where you take some of these strategies that have uh, that have shown some initial promise and uh, implementing in your classroom and collecting some data around how it went and then you know making adjustments based upon how it went so that you can implement it again and you can sort of refine what you're doing so that by the time you you finish your thesis or your capstone you actually have some sort of pedagogical practice or pedagogical strategy that you've used in in your classroom in a, in a blended or online format that you've really found that with your particular students in your context this is the way i need to do it in order to have success and you know, so uh, for a lot of these, I think that's a good model. And even for your own teacher professional learning. So if you're not in a, a graduate program, you know, you've already got your master's, and you know, heck no, you you're never going back and doing a doctorate. Um, you know, there's no, you don't need it, or you just have no interest in it, or you're like my wife, where you know the master's was just so painful that she would never go back and, and willingly subject herself to more of this stuff. Um, there's no reason why you can't do this on your own. I mean, it's easy enough to sit down and sort of plan out, um, you know, I'm going to attack this particular problem that I'm having in my class. And based upon some of the things I found with the Michigan virtual, or maybe something in that 13, uh, you know, that lessons learned book or something I got from the virtual high school um, research that's been done, I'm going to try this. You know, and if you do it as, as a team, so you get like three or four teachers at your school, not necessarily all tackling the same problem, but all going through the same process, you know, and you're each attacking your own individual personal problem, but you're doing it in a systematic way and collecting data that, you know, hopefully will help you answer some of your questions and allow you to refine whatever it is you're trying so that you can actually improve what it is you're doing and, and provide a better quality of experience for your students. And we do have a few more minutes for a few questions while you're putting those in there before you leave our session today, please go over and click on the polls and give us a rating for our session today too. We'd like to see what you thought of it and all of that before we leave. So go ahead and put those questions in. We do have a few more minutes before we will go then to our uh, next session, which starts here at looks like 515 Eastern time for our virtual engagement. So please add those questions in. Yeah, we, I think we've got about three minutes left. So uh, that gives you a chance and, and hopefully I'll see some of you in the the, the next session in the conversation session where I'll actually be able to see you in, in that particular session because I think we're in the meeting format as opposed to the webinar format there so it'll be a little bit more back and forth and a little bit easier to sort of interact. Well seeing that there are no questions coming in at the moment did, we, did you want to give any final comments or thoughts before we wrap everything up? Um, I, I guess, actually, that's, that's a wonderful leading, Dave, because I, 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 there was something I was going to include at the end of my thing, but I thought I wanted to make sure I had time for folks to have questions, so I didn't. Uh, so that's a wonderful lead into this. Um, you know, I, I said a couple of times throughout the session that, you know, we can start to see the light at the end of the tunnel here. Um, you know, and, but I've also tried to stress that there's a lot we still don't know about what's coming down the pike. And when it comes to these type of things, I'm by no means an expert, uh, you know, when it comes to public health and virology and all those other things that my colleagues at Toro, who, because we're mainly a medical school, will be able to tell you a lot more about, um, you know, I, I do what the rest of you guys do. You know, I, I watch the news, I listen to the experts. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, the experts, I think in the U.S., 
you know, Dr. Fauci is probably the one that we've come to, to trust the most. And, you know, in, in the fall, he was quoted as saying in, in, in an interview, I think it was with MSNBC, you know, he said, I think it will easily be the end of 2021 and perhaps even into the next year uh, before we start to have some semblance of normality or normality, sorry. Um, you know, so that's still a fair amount into our next school year. Um, you know, because I'm Canadian, I always like to give the Canadian reference. Um, our version of Dr. Fauci, our Chief Public Health Officer for Canada, uh, Dr. Teresa Tam, um, over the summer, it was late July, early August, um, she said it, and I think what was really a nice Canadian way of saying it, um, she said Canadians should expect to live with the current inconveniences for the next two to three years. Um, I thought current inconveniences was just a, a nice way of saying, you know, social distancing, masking, some of the other protections that we've seen put in place into schools, some form of hybrid learning, knowing that we might have to jump into an online format for a short period of time, um, you know, because it, it might not happen. But if we have the expectation that it could, then we can be prepared for it to happen. Um, you know, so I think those are... are uh, some of the, the things I'd uh, leave you with now that we've probably got about 30 seconds and uh, still with no questions, I'm going to assume that I'll chat with some of you in about 15 minutes. That's correct. Well, thank you, Dr. Barber, for being here and sharing all your knowledge. There were some great comments in the chat about some things that they have learned and they were really excited to uh, see that. We're going to go ahead and close out this session. We'll see you uh, in about 15 minutes over in our networking session. And again, yes, we get to be on camera. We get to talk to each other and all of those types of things. So thank you for joining us. And we'll see you again. Remember, this recording will be available. Give it some time to process because this was an hour and a half. So let it process. Come back to the uh, website. Look on there and you'll see the recording. So we'll see you in a few. Thank you very much for joining us and we will end out our meeting now.